All right, before we uh, leave the world of the WWE, a few comments on the Ric Flair evil, WWE evil. They're doing profiles of all the dastardly heels, right? And last week was Randy Orton, and I went back and I, I caught some of that, uh, but I didn't have time to go through the whole thing. But I liked, I liked this one better than I like most of these profiles and documentaries because the younger guys... They spend the entire show pretty much, everybody that, all the talking heads, anybody that knows them or comments on them, and even the subject of the particular program, they will spend the majority of the time telling you how they weren't really that, how they made you hate them on purpose, how that it was all a carefully contrived act to make you hate them and they weren't really like that and with this show everybody from flair on down said no this was fucking flair this was a flair it's the way he lived the whole fucking life he was better than everybody else and he let them know it and he had more money and more women and blah 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 he did the whole thing whereas as a result of that there you know he doesn't have more money now or more women or but he went through it all but at least this guy was real that's the problem with a, a documentary or a profile on any of the modern talent is the first thing you find out is they're completely not really who you thought they were so that what but otherwise i told you you would love the footage on this and you would hate the talking heads how accurate was i the talking heads were ridiculously <laughs> inadequate for any sort of historical wrestling piece they get the biggest bubbleheads who are only there because they blow wwe and they know that they're safe, and they'll say stupid shit that usually isn't historically accurate. That, but, but, that shoemaker guy was back. Well, I, I don't, but not even historically accurate. Just in, it's like asking me to comment on the space program. What the fuck do I know about it? If you were an expert in it, you could talk to it. But these people, they're an expert in being wrestling fans and wanting to be involved with WWE. They're not experts in actual wrestling history. And it was just a bunch of idiots talking, giving their opinions on Ric Flair. So I don't think that helped. I, I jotted some of them down. Because you said they're... I, I don't even know where WWE found these people because I don't know who some of them are. I know, Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil, ladies and gentlemen, was legitimately on this program talking about Ric Flair. As you mentioned, who is David Shoemaker? Who is... Uh, is he even a fan or what does he do in pertaining to the world, the periphery of wrestling that you would ask him to comment on? So I've never heard the name before the last documentary where we said, who the fuck is this guy? Yeah, the Andre the Giant documentary where he talked uh, with confidence about how Andre this... would tour the country as a heel and the top good guy <laughs> would wrestle the heel giant all throughout the country. This guy doesn't know anything and he's an idiot. He's part of Bill Simmons's team. And he's had a wrestling podcast apparently over there for a while. And I think if you don't know, if you're a casual fan who doesn't know much, maybe you hear someone like that and you think he knows something. But anyone who actually knows something looks at a guy like that and goes, this guy's a fucking idiot of the highest magnitude. And he exposes himself as that every time. And he keeps doing it. And I'll say one last thing. <laughs> and I've liked 30 for 30s. And I've liked some other stuff. But one of the biggest indictments of Bill Simmons is the fact that this guy who knows nothing about wrestling is the purported wrestling expert for Bill Simmons. And they use him in documentaries, ones that are part of that group, like the Andre the Giant one, and then ones like this, the guy knows nothing. And that's what's ridiculous. And I think uh, there's too many people out there who call themselves wrestling experts or wrestling journalists or different things. And there are real wrestling journalists. I'm not saying it's everyone, but there are certain people. It's just a class of idiot you don't find in other places. Ron Funches. <laughs> I've seen, he's a comedian, right? I think so. So the, I've seen on Twitter or something, Ron Funches connected to being a, so a comedian. Um, did we mention Dr. Phil, Peter Rosenberg and Sam Roberts are DJs on the radio, right? So we know this much. They're New York radio guys who are big wrestling fans. And that's what WWE yeah. looks for. Friendly radio people who will be so happy to be involved with us that they'll just blow us all the time. <laughs> endlessly and that's what they got but uh, but basically uh, charlotte was on there and sean michaels couple of comments and bruce pritchard 
they, at least they've ever actually been in the wrestling profession. But I love the footage. Uh, you know, they went into Flair's childhood. John Cena narrates this. They went into his childhood, and I, he got in trouble and uh, went to military school. And the AWA footage with Ganya training Chris Taylor and those guys in the barn and, and et cetera, and you wouldn't know who anybody was from watching this program unless you already knew who they were, otherwise than Vern Gagne's training wrestlers. But um, and, then a one, and then Sam Roberts like, and Vern Gagne had one of the best wrestling schools of its time or whatever he said. I said, what? He was one of the greatest wrestling trainers of his time. Yeah. There weren't wrestling trainers. <laughs> Gagne would do camps every so what, every year or two, right? If he found some good prospects, when he signed Patera and Chris Taylor out of the 72 Olympics, he put a camp together that included Cosrow, the Iron Sheik, uh, Flair, and Billy Robinson was one of the main trainers. And uh, Bob Ruggers. Yeah, but, and Bob Ruggers was in that also. And then, you know, did he do another one a few years later when he found somebody else? It wasn't like an ongoing yeah, training Steamboat. program. Steamboat. There yeah. you go. So anyway, um, they, by the way, uh, Ben Brown, if you're listening, you should have made the deal I offered you about seven or eight years ago, and you wouldn't have to use fourth generation dupes of the mid Atlantic films. You could have the stuff, uh, transferred from the original source. I should, I should put those back on sale now that they're advertising them, but watching this footage, it just reminds me there's no heel anywhere in the business this good anymore at being a heel. I'm not even talking about in the ring or wrestling in the ring. I'm talking about a heel performer and personality that just has the, the package looks that good, knows what to do. They covered the rivalry with dusty, which was the average man against the antithesis of the average man. Sandy Scott in the pull apart. Did you see that one? I did. And Flair was quoted as saying, oh, yeah, me and Dusty, you know, we we wrestled in the Orange Bowl. We had 40,000 people. Fuck, I knew me and the Midnight shouldn't have left early that night. We were on third from last. We got out and beat the traffic. 30,000 more people came in. <laughs> uh, the cage match footage of the angle in Atlanta in September of 85 when the horsemen attacked dusty and broke his leg and you see the fans trying to storm the cage twice in five years dusty was able to do that angle in the same building the omni in atlanta with different heels and actually Ole was in both of them and get people to riot and climb the fucking cage to try to save him um, but anyway, you know, again, all of the eighties NWA footage looks so violent and the guys look like they're mad and the fans are, they're not jumping up and down, screaming at a cool move and going, holy shit, holy shit, fight forever. They're jumping up and down going, kill that motherfucker. I want to see it blood. That son of a bitch. I got a gun here. If you don't, if you need help, that kind of, uh, and it just, it, We've lost it. We've fucking lost it. And there was a segment on how the, the period where WCW is so mismanaged and or buried flair in the mid nineties and through, you know, Bischoff's bullshit. Then they showed shit stain shaving his head. Again, Rick has said, and he said it again here that he had lost his confidence at that point in time that, you know, he was in a bad place and he was just going along with whatever, but somebody in that, uh, it, it, well, I, I was about to say, and now I'll correct myself. I was about to say somebody in that company should have stopped that shaving Ric Flair's head on television with the goddamn supposed head of creative involved. He should have been beaten with a fucking ax handle for being involved in that. But that was when Bischoff and all the other people with pull wanted to humiliate Flair because they could never get over him any other way. But finally, the formation of Evolution with Batista and Triple H and Orton, it gave him his confidence back, got him to, you know, enjoy the business again. And then 
the last segment was basically his retirement, but notoriety today, every sports figure, sports team. What is it? Give me, give me two Ric Flairs and a whoo or two claps and a Ric Flair or whatever the fuck it is. And he's got a drip now too. Rick does. I would, if you'd have told me 35 years ago, Ric Flair was going to have a drip. I said, of course he probably has several times, but now it's actually a, a good thing. It's positive. It's positive to have a drip today. But, I, you know, it was, they weren't going in into any detail whatsoever on any of the well-publicized, especially recently unsavory parts of his life, but it's a 45 minutes with commercials factored out uh, piece on one of the most popular and well-known wrestlers of all time. So it's going to get ratings for the USA network, just like it did for a and E. And I love the footage, even if it was produced with a fucking trowel and a goddamn roll of duct tape. All right. <laughs> did you love it? No, I hated it. I thought it was horrible. Yeah, no, I know. I could tell. It's just, it was a badly made documentary. I mean, beyond anything, even if you like the clips, Tell me that's a coherent story they told in that documentary over whatever. It felt like it was three hours. I know it was only 44 minutes. Or <laughs> it was completely incoherent. It bounced all over the place. Again, there's you know, a lot of and I, I, I will give you that. When, whenever I even start to watch these with an element of if you didn't know, you wouldn't know after you watch this, but I already know shit. So I just recognize it. It falls apart. So that... You have a lot of people there who are just there because they please WWE and they don't know anything. That. And the other thing is, and I don't want to go too deep into this because I'm sure you don't want to right now. But when you have this documentary, I don't think Cena's good as a narrator. I will say that too. But when you have a documentary. He's an executive producer too, though. Did you see that? Yeah, it's his show. I mean, that's why he's narrating it. <laughs> but with Ric Flair in this documentary, they presented it like, now all these years later, look, the hip hop guys love him and the sports teams love him and all the fans just accept him and love him. I don't know if there's ever been a time more than now where there are more people who grew up loving Ric Flair who don't want to see him anymore. Who are disappointed, yeah. Without exaggeration, almost every wrestling message board, so many emails that come in, various things you see on Twitter, is people who loved Ric Flair and it may not even be about the helicopter thing. It's not just that. It's a culmination of a lot of different things over the last 20 years or so. But I think that was, the, that was the other big thing when you're presenting it like, and now here we are all these years later, everything's just wonderful. Hey, you should have said, yeah, he's, everything's wonderful. He's unemployable. AEW wouldn't touch him. WWE wouldn't touch him. And they don't address anything else. I don't know. And I, again, it was an incoherent, babbling documentary where they just threw clip after clip and no. For no reason, with no sense, badly done. Really, really badly done. Pathetic, it even. It, the, the wrestling footage was somewhat edited in a mix master in terms of the, you got something now and then something 10 years before it happened next and then back and forth and et cetera. But let me ask you this then. Is it kind of the same thing? Because, I mean, a lot of people are going to be upset of, uh, over the dark side of the ring thing at flair but even still you mentioned before that aired more people have started on the message boards that they used to love flair but now it's ah. is it just a situation where it's kind of like cody and aew at first it was fine but then it got a little much and he wouldn't tone it down and uh, uh, not related to rick's in ring work, but more his personal life. Do you think that it started being a thing where maybe ten years ago, Rick, shouldn't you ought to in the in the people's mind, shouldn't you ought to slow it down? And then he was near death and in the hospital because of his, as he's admitted, alcohol abuse and et cetera, et cetera. Shouldn't he at some point? start acting and appearing like a 72 year old man instead of a 72 year old nature boy are people like rick will you ever please slow down we used to love you but this has gotten too much too far is do you think that's it i think there's a lot of that i think there's people who know a lot about the different stories and there have been a lot of horror stories over the last 15 years i'm no defender of carrie silken rick flair ripped off carrie silken 
And a lot That's of people, a lot of people know that. I'm not a big high spots fan. Ric Flair ripped off high spots. A lot of people know that. Ole Anderson said the reason him and Ric Flair fell out was Ric Flair borrowed money from him. Not only didn't pay him back, I think wouldn't even call him back. He's not unique with that story. There's been all these different stories. There's been scenes in bars that people have talked about. There's been rudeness to people. There's been public intoxication. I mean, it's one thing after another after another. And it doesn't seem like anything changes. And I compare him in a lot of ways to wrestling's Mickey Mantle. But Mickey Mantle eventually, at the very end, you know, after his body fell apart because of alcohol abuse, it did seem like he finally changed at the very, very (laughs) end. But Ric Flair, it's like going in reverse. And, you know, you see people in that documentary, like even Charlotte saying, there's no separation between the person Ric Flair or, you know, Richard Flair or whatever, and the nature boy. There's no separation. And I would say, but there was. Not necessarily a separation, but he understood They had a couple clips of maybe when he was on a talk show. I'm in my suit. I'm the NWA champion. I have to be professional. I have to act professional. Yeah. Talk professional. Like that version of Ric Flair is gone. Like that version's gone. The one, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, it's a pleasure to be here in this town. Like none of that. He was a heel when he was doing that stuff, but he knew how to be professional. He first won the title. And in 1981, remember, he'd only been a nature boy for what? five, six years, maybe after the plane crash. And all of a sudden he is bestowed on the most prestigious prize in our sport for real, legitimately the NWA world heavyweight championship. And I think it, it, he'd always heard, yeah, wear the suits, which he, I mean, the guys, the Carolinas, him and Valentine, all those guys, they were wearing the suits beforehand, but wear the suits, dress up the Halliburton, you're, you know, your first class, you're representing the entire business. He invented wearing suits. If you watch that documentary, no wrestler oh, ever yeah. wore suits to the buildings before Ric Flair. Yeah, except for Luthez and Whipper Billy Watson and Buddy Holy Rogers, Rogers. Yeah, everyone. Buddy Rogers. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, but at that point when he would, he would still be Flair in gimmick on wrestling programs, but when he was doing outside media, like I said, a news show or whatever, even George Michael's sports machine the first time, from that early 80s period where he was still, he wanted to make sure that he didn't do anything to taint the perception of the NWA world title, but then by the mid-80s, and when he's pretty much come to own it, and it's come to be synonymous with him, then he starts being able to go over the top because he can get away with it, but then he never... He never found that way to gear back a little bit on, and just became the over-the-top nature boy. You know, if you watch Letterman from the early 80s, and I'm a big Letterman fan, Paul Schaefer, you know, he was always the hip keyboard player. He had a great band. He could play cool stuff. It wasn't the kind of stuff you heard on Johnny Carson. Yeah. If you watch Letterman, I don't know, 2010 or whatever, Paul Schaefer became a character of himself. Wearing yeah. wacky outfits, his head is shaved, he's making faces when he plays keyboards. Wasn't the same guy. Ric Flair, he was never going to grow old gracefully, I guess, like a Buddy Rogers or whatever we have in our mind. But it seems like he's become a parody of Nature Boy Ric Flair sometimes, more than just an older version of Ric Flair. I just wish he'd slow down and take care of his health and etc. because, you know, he's already had... A, uh, a close call there and you know i'd i'd be home underneath the dogwood tree with my feet up reading a book and watching the squirrels but see that's the kind of shit that makes me happy and i don't i don't know that rick would have ever wanted to watch squirrels unless he could bet on who was going to climb the tree you know the yeah. fastest or or whatever unless the squirrels had kamikazes yeah or possibly unless he could get a nut on the way down so then he might but anyway nevertheless hey um, you know i hated it i thought it was a horrible documentary <laughs> but i want to say <laughs> mention that you brought up the randy orton one i thought that was fantastic i watched that whole thing last week and i know you didn't you only saw parts of it again different style because it's really randy telling his story with other people yeah. filling in things i thought that was incredibly well done i thought that was great I liked it as a program and I liked it because it was well done and they had more wrestling talking heads that were expert and Randy does a good job, but it's just the, again, 
You know, where he where he said, well, look, here's how I can make you believe what I say when I work myself up and blah, blah, blah. And it's just everything about, oh, yes, this was all this carefully orchestrated plan to be a heel and to make you because the wrestling business is all entertainment. And we all know this now. And I just still hate that. But at least with with Flair. Yeah, he was the real guy. Matter of fact, he couldn't do most of the shit on TV, didn't real life. At least there's some real to wrestling uh, in that respect. But. And by the way, do you think anyone at WWE realizes the one clip of Ric Flair from Mid-Atlantic from your tapes that they chose was the most racist one? The boy, Conway, with the funny looking <laughs> hair. Do they realize the part they picked? <laughs> uh, yeah, that interview with his uncle, Rip Hawk. His uncle, uh, Rip Hawk. You look at that Rip Hawk, 60 years old. He's like 40. <laughs> I think, well, actually, I th I think that may have been the, the early thing. They were going to make him a relative of Rip's, and then he became a, a, a relative of the Anderson brothers. But uh, that was always one of the funny things, not to make light of the Ole Anderson, Ric Flair personal issues. But whenever, you know, Ole Anderson, you bring up Ric Flair, oh, he's a piece of shit. You know, he does his usual stuff. But then one of his complaints would be, we made him an Anderson. We made him an Anderson. <laughs> like, that carries some weight. We made him an Anderson. Hey, at the time, that's what got Flair over. He's a member of the Anderson family. Well, that's all we need to know. Because they were over and nobody knew who Ric Flair was. It's all context, baby. All context. But I can see where Ole might be incensed. We made him an Anderson. He's going to have to turn in his membership card in the Norwegian Anderson Society. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, it, but you know, again, we've mentioned Flair has had a lot of medical problems. And a lot of it was, you know, as we mentioned, he said alcohol related, but it tears your, in, your insides up. You know, and a, a, a very important part, I don't know if you know this, Brian, or not. I don't know if you've ever studied this in school, but a very important part of your good health and your continued successful life is having a stomach. Did you know that? I believe that's a requirement. Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, if, if most people, if they have to have their stomach and intestines and all their internal organs taken out, they don't fare too well after that. It's, it's a, a slow, but steady downhill slide after that. So you got to take care of your stomach. I have a gut feeling about my gut. It needs taken care of because do you know that your GI tract is in your gut? And that's that's actually not anything to do with the army or infantry because at first when I heard about my GI tract, I thought it would involve marching. Apparently it doesn't. <laughs> no, it, it, it doesn't because I don't know why that one got me. <laughs> it it but it did, and I'll I'll remind you later. But the thing is, your GI tract processes all this shit. Literally. And so you got to keep it working and operating. And, and the probiotics and the prebiotics, along with the symbiotics, are, are what you need for good gut health, for ensuring thorough digestion, ensuring delivery to the colon. And as we talked about, colon delivery is sweeping the nation. People, especially when the pandemic started, instantly people started becoming colon deliverers. And now they're delivering to colons across the country, but you got to make sure if you take a probiotic and a prebiotic that it goes all the way to the colon. And that's what the folks at Seed can do for you. S-E-E-D, Seed. How else would you spell it? Because you may not know this, but not all probiotics are created equal. The daily symbiotic from seed is a broad spectrum two in one probiotic and prebiotic with a proprietary formulation of 24 distinct probiotic strains in scientifically studied dosages. They have sat down and studied these probiotics and how big of a strain they can be on you, and they've determined that these are not too big of a strain because you don't want to strain yourself. My mother always used to say, Don't strain your milk, Jimmy. If I tried to lift something, you'll strain your milk. Well, seed won't let you strain your milk. It supports benefits in and beyond the gut. It will support ease of bloating, healthy regularity, and ease of evacuation. See, it's all part of 
getting all that bad shit out and moving the good shit in. So if you're bloated, that means you're full of shit. And if you don't have healthy regularity, that means you're not regularly expunging the shit that you're full of. In some cases, I know people are so full of shit, they can get rid of it every day out of their mouth and they're still full of it. And also the ease of evacuation. Folks, when you get on seed, this broad spectrum two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic, you will be evacuating all over the place. You will evacuate morning, evening, and night. Under control whenever you're ready to go and evacuate. Yes, well, I would make appointments ahead of time if I were you, because you're going to need them. Uh, But it will be easy for you to evacuate. As a matter of fact, the whole place will be empty. I mean, there'll be tumbleweeds down there, rolling, just rolling across. It'll be, and the wind whistling, because there'll be nothing there to stop it. It's going to be evacuated. And it also supports your gut barrier. That's a barrier between your gut and the outside world that wants to get in and do horrible things to it. It'll support your skin health. That with this, with, you have this seed probiotic and prebiotic. A lot of people have had a problem uh, in modern times with their skin falling off, and that won't happen with this. It'll stay right on you where it belongs. It'll it promote your heart health and micronutrient synthesis. And I can't let me say this again, folks. Micronutrient synthesis. I can't stress this enough micronutrient synthesis it's all part of seed start a healthy new habit today visit seed.com slash drive use the code drive to redeem 20 percent off your first month of seeds daily symbiotic you will look better you'll feel better you'll eat better and you'll shit better especially if you're already full of it with Seed's Daily Symbiotic. That's seed.com slash drive. 20% off. 20% off your next dump, courtesy (laughs) of Seed and us here at the program. All right, well, before we hop over to the other side of the promotional war and check out AEW, Brian, what's going on in the world of the Arcadian Vanguard Network this fine week? Another action-packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network this fine week. Get information about all the shows on Twitter, at Super Podcast, or on you, Facebook. Do you have sludge in your ducks this fine week? No, but we promise the best dreck you can get on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Super Podcast. Duck dreck? A few notes before we get the duck out of here. See, I'll hit you with that again. This week on Breaking Kayfabe with Bowdrin and Barry, a big episode. The boys talk with Dr. D, David Schultz. Hear that today. Once again, BoundrinPod.com. Or look for Breaking Kayfabe with Boundrin and Barry wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Also want to make mention, Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon. Another big episode this week. Brian's guest, Rob Van Dam. Hear RVD with Brian Solomon today at suawpod.com or look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcast. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast. Oh, God. The Mothership! You know, my house guests right now are wondering what the hell just happened. (laughs) But at least I wasn't on the intercom like I was earlier. (laughs) Opening week Star Wars is recorded. It is edited. We're just uh, about to put it up, so stay tuned. The next day or so, it's going to be up. Four hours or so, give or take, with me and several of the stars of the Super Podcast talking baseball, and then eventually even talking wrestling. 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. More episodes in production. The Mothership! Oh, goddamn you, hold on. I feel like Stone Cold now. Yeah. When the glass breaks, it's your ass.